Hi, I'm, I'm Ellen Nimmons. I'm the Assistant International Editor for the Associated Press. And I'm here today to interview Kathy Gannon, uh, the AP's longtime correspondent extraordinaire. Kathy Gannon. Thank you. Um, I'm Kathy Gannon. I'm the Special Regional Correspondent for Afghanistan and Pakistan for the Associated Press. And happy to be here for the Overseas Press Club of America. Now, Kathy, I'd like to take you back right away to April 4th of last mm -hmm. year. Uh, we know this was a difficult day for you, but can you tell us how your day began? Sure. Um, yeah, very difficult. Um, actually, we were in eastern Afghanistan in Host, um, which is maybe about a 50, 50 miles maybe from the border with uh, Pakistan. Um, an area that is very strong uh, Haqqani uh, controlled. The Haqqani network is a very powerful um, group that is aligned with the Taliban um, and probably one of the strongest and also has been declared a terrorist organization by the U.S. Um, so Anya um, Niedringhaus, who is uh, was my colleague and, and very close friend and photographer for the Associated Press, um, Pulitzer Prize winning, amazing photographer. And Anya and I had been traveling as a team uh, in Afghanistan since really since 2009. We had been doing our uh, uh, work together as a team, both going to um, uh, outlying areas, um, Pakistan. We had also worked together in Pakistan, so we, we very much a, a team her doing the, the photography, me doing the, the, the print. So we had decided for the elections, because April 5th was the presidential election, so we had decided for the elections we wanted to go outside of Kabul. So we wanted to go to an area that would be interesting, that maybe could indicate or give some sense of what these elections would mean for a country that is coming to the end of uh, U.S. Uh, um, uh, involvement and in coalition involvement, um, uh, a presidential election that didn't involve President Hamid Karzai, a really a new era. And we wanted to be able to show from an area that really reflected all the difficulties that Afghans face, both in terms of the Taliban involvement, the poverty, the rural, all of these things. So we decided on host. So we had actually driven in the day before on April 3rd. And we had, uh, um, because the flight had been canceled, and so we, we decided to drive. We had to wear the, the burqas because it was going through Logar province, which is a very dangerous area, which is where uh, uh, people have been kidnapped um, in, in the past. So uh, we got to, to host. We, got, we, stayed with the, we were staying with the um, governor in his guest house because I had known him from before, and he had given permission that, yes, we could, and it's a very well guarded, so that was good. So we, um, we went to see the police chief and that the day before, and he said, we'll be taking the last of the ballot boxes out to the rural areas in, uh, uh, along the border with Pakistan. Um, so we said, yes, we'd very much like to go with you. This was the last of the, the ballot boxes to be, give, uh, to be handed out. So uh, we got up the next morning, and, uh, and Anya was so funny because we had set up our, our sat phones and everything, and, and, and Anya was so funny because she just loved the idea of at the end when she comes back to file. So she had put the, our sleeping bag, she had laid them all out very nicely. She had her sat phone off on the left. She had my sat phone all rigged up on the right. We had our coffee cups, mine on the right, hers on the left. We were all, so, all organized. And so she said, okay, I'll start to do this right away when we get back. And you. So she was, uh, she, she loved going out into the, 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 uh, the field. So we went and um, we were traveling with the military and police from host to um, a place called Tanai, which is a, a small area, village area. And, and actually, uh, one thing we had been told was that Tanai was more of a um, pro-government type of place. There were a lot of uh, people from Tanai in the government, a lot of people in the military, a lot in the police. So we thought, okay, you know, we still get a good sense, but it's, it's a fairly reasonably uh, um, secure, safe-ish type of thing. So we started out on the convoy. I only wanted to be up at the front with one of the lead ones. And because I, I, I find the biggest concern for me has always been in Afghanistan, um, improvised explosive devices. And it just does such devastating uh, 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 damage to, to, to you. So I had said, Bill, stay with me. We were in the middle. She had already taken all the pictures of the convoy. So, you know, it's just 
always the lead vehicles get hit if anything's going to happen. So anyway, so we got to this compound. It's a police compound. And there were also soldiers there. The police were dividing up the ballot boxes, saying this goes this village, this one to this village, this one. So we did all our interviews. And, and it's funny because one of the police, they, they were talking to them. And Anya and I were looking, and they gave them first aid kits. And so Anya and I are looking, we're thinking, Jesus, you sure wouldn't want to be stuck with one of those who had like, you know, I don't know, like a bandage and, and, and you know, a piece of gauze and, and, and no painkillers or anything. Um, but Anya had finished taking all her pictures, and I had done all my interviews and everything, and we were waiting. We were going to go to this village 15 minutes away where they were going to bring the ballot boxes. And, and Anya had this image of these pictures she was going to take, and it was going to be just this, to, to really give a sense of what people had to um, endure or to, to do to, to, uh, to, to vote. And, and that it's not an easy thing. And so people would get that sense of what it, what it meant for an Afghan in that part mm -hmm. of the country to actually go and, and, and uh, mark their ballot. So it, it had started to just drizzle just a, a little bit, and I hadn't had a cigarette in a while. Uh, so, uh, so we decided to get into the car, and um, Rafiullah, our translator, very nice person, he was there, but he didn't come in the car with us. And, uh, Nishanuddin, who is the AP's, um, AP Television's uh, stringer in, uh, in host, and a very nice person, and it was his car that we were driving, actually. He was still doing some uh, videoing, so, so he was busy doing that. So Anya and I got in the back, and really we weren't there for more than a couple of minutes, I, I, you know. Um, and Anya had just, we were laughing about something I can't even remember, and Anya had taken out her, her package of cigarettes, but she hadn't, she hadn't lit up, um, and we were just laughing about something. And I don't remember seeing the shooter um, uh, opening fire or hearing him. I was told later that he did shout, Alo Akbar. But I didn't see it. What I, where I, rem my memory is, when the bullets hit you, your body jerks. And I remember the last of the bullets hitting me. And so I, my, my body was jerking. And, and when it stopped, I thought we, there had been an explosion right by the car. So I thought that, oh my god, there's been a, a bombing. And, and, and it's, it, they planted it right under our car, near our car. And then I could smell the gunpowder. It was so strong. So I realized that, that it was shooting. And, um, and I looked down, and, and I, was, I was still upright, and, and Anya was upright, and we were leaning into each other, but neither one of us had, had fallen forward. Or, or, um, so I was leaning into to Anya, and she was leaning against me. And I looked down, initially, and my hand was um, almost severed from my, my wrist, and I couldn't move my right uh, hand or shoulder or anything, so I was really sort of and I could see out the window, I guess. I could see the translator and uh, the driver. And, and all I remember saying is, please, please help us. And, and I'm sure they were in shock, you know, Ellen, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. So I, I, uh, I, and they probably didn't know whether we were alive or, you know. So they jumped in the car immediately. And, and I heard a siren and we, we took off to, to get to host. I looked over at Anya, and I could see the side, her gray hair and everything, but I, I didn't, it, it didn't, she didn't look bad, or I didn't have any sense of, of, so I didn't know what condition Anya was in, and there was so much blood around me, and um, I thought, well, the artery has been severed, so I thought it was just a matter of time, and I knew that the, the, the trip to the host was, had been 45 minutes and over some very um, uh, uh, bumpy roads and obviously the terrain was less than, than, than comfortable. So we were leaning against each other and, and I was really just trying to breathe and stay calm and, and I thought I wasn't going to make it so I thought I was dying so I just wanted to go quietly and I wanted to go without uh, fear or, you know, I, and I, so I said my goodbyes and I, I just thought, you know, I've had a great life and, you know, I was really trying my best to be as, as, as calm and peaceful as, as I could and, and Anya wasn't 
moving or saying anything, and I didn't know. And at one point, I, I, I do remember sort of nudging, nudging her, you know, and, and she didn't respond, but she didn't do anything. It's not like she fell over or anything like that, so I didn't know. The driver later said that, that all he heard in the back, so he didn't know what was really going on either. Mm -hmm. I think he realized Anya had died immediately. Um, but, and, and the translator kept saying, Kathy, stay with us, don't, you know. Um, but they didn't know because we were so quiet. And, and the driver after said, all he remembers is every once in a while I'd go, ouch, ouch, <laughs> because the roads were so bad and, and, and the pain was, 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 uh, was, was pretty, pretty bad at the time as well. So then I got to, we got to the hospital. And, uh, and they came right away to the car. Um, Anya was on the left and I was on the right. And, um, and what had happened is the, the shooter had emptied his Kalashnikov at close range, the entire clip. Um, um, I was shot six times, three here, um, one in my shoulder that had shattered my shoulder blade and punctured my lung, um, one that ripped through the side and this, uh, damaged the right side of this, and another one that, that smashed into to this side and they've repaired with, with um, hardware and that. And the three that took out literally a, a, a giant chunk of my, my left uh, uh, forearm. Um, so they took me out of the car and they said, get on the gurney. Very, very basic hospital and host. But, but really to their credit, they really tried to do everything. And, and I didn't know, Anya was on the other side and I, I didn't know for sure, you know, I mean, and, and, and neither one of us had been saying anything. So mm -hmm. it was, you know, and then they just took me in um, and started cutting my clothes off and everything. And I was still really trying to focus on staying calm. And, and, and I kept saying, you know, please, I need some painkillers. And, and they must have, have given some. And then they took me for a, um, a chest x-ray. Um, and then the surgeon, an Afghan surgeon, really lovely person, and he said, we have got to do surgery on you now because we have to stop the bleeding mm -hmm. or you won't make it. And, uh, and he said, I just want you to know that your life is as important to me as it is to you, which was so, in a, in a way, he was just trying to say, don't worry, I'm, I'm going to do my best, you know. And so um, they took me into the, the surgery, and, and, uh, and the last thing I remember was this old guy was trying to intubate me, and he's shoving the, the tube down, and, <coughs> and I'm joking, and I'm just like, you know. And... Uh, and, and, and he, you could see he's getting a little impatient, <laughs> you know, with this foreigner, show this down there. And so the doctor said something to him in Pashto, and, uh, and they gave me the gas and knocked me out, and he did his surgery. Um, I woke up the next morning in Kabul um, at the French military hospital. Anya, they had, I found out later that they had taken, Anya died immediately. Um, she was on the left side, the shooter was on the left mm -hmm. side. Um, she didn't, she wouldn't have felt anything um, or, or known at all what, what, what had happened, I, I'm, I'm absolutely sure. Um, and I'm also really sure, uh, and I know this for a fact, I, I just know it in my heart, that if you were, were, if Anya were here and you were to ask Anya, would you do anything differently, she would say no. I know that for a fact, and, and because when the, the rain canceled our flight, and we didn't know whether they'd, we'd get permission from um, AP Regional Office in Cairo, the security to go on that road, because really that was the big concern, um, because David Rhodes, the New York Times uh, reporter, had been kidnapped in Logar, and mm -hmm. it was pretty bad for that, uh, for kidnappings. But, uh, I mean, Aini was in tears when she thought that we were going to be stuck in Kabul for the elections. And, uh, and then we thought, okay, we'll go to Kandahar, but she and I have been to Kandahar so often. And, you know, so we really had sort of decided that this was. And when we finally got the permission to go, she was just thrilled. She had, okay, she was going to do these portraits, and she was going to send them in on the, the Tuesday because that's the best time to get them in so they get the best exposure. I mean, she had thought of everything, and she was just really um, so happy to be going. Um, so uh, I, I, I say that because as, as horrific as everything was, and, and, and it is, and I miss her every day, is I know that this is something that Anya would never have changed, and, 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 and she loved to go out and, and do these, these stories and, and, and uh, 
out in the field, not you know in 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 the headquarters or in the. So she was very much uh, that, and we got from host to they moved us from host to the forward operating base at, um, at Camp Chapman, which is right on the border with Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And apparently, the Afghans moved us because there's some protocol that the Americans can't get in to host mm -hmm. or something like that. And then um, President Karzai had called to General Dunford, I was told later, um, saying, and Dunford at, th at that point hadn't heard. And apparently, as soon as he heard from Karzai, he wasn't sure what Karzai, because they weren't having the best of relationship <laughs> at that time. You know, Hamid was still the president. and. And anyway, he called and Dunford came on and, and Dunford said, or uh, President Karzai said to General Dunford, he says, you have to move her and you have to get her here now. And you, so, so they did uh, send two helicopters with Anya and I to, from Cap Cha Camp Chapman to Kabul. And so both Anya and I were brought to Kabul. And, uh, and then I was medevaced to the private hospital uh, in Germany, and, and the reason for the private hospital, and I, I, I believe this was AP's decision, which I think was a, a brilliant decision, rather than going with the American troops and going to the American hospital in Germany, I think the thinking was, was that as bad as my injuries were, a lot of the soldiers, when they're taken, they're missing limbs, there's brain damage, I mean, it's, it's horrific, horrific, and, and, and so, when you arrive at that hospital, you're triaged. So the more serious will be uh, uh, treated first, obviously, and then you go down the road. And so I really think the, the thinking was that a private hospital get full attention and that with immediate to get me stabilized and everything. And then from there, um, the decision as to where to go to, to once there was a determination, because of course at, at that time you don't know how bad are the injuries, what is it. Uh, um, I was talking to the Canadian ambassador in Kabul the other day and she said, you know, we were told you were in a coma, we didn't know where you're going to live. Was it? So all those things were very much uh, uh, unknown. So AP had decided that I should be meta back to, to um, Germany to a private hospital, which is where I was uh, for seven or eight days and then medevac to the Hospital for Special Surgeries in New York because, again, AP had um, investigated all the possible uh, doctors and looked at their expertise. Um, there was somebody from Chicago, there was somebody from New York, obviously, um, and also from Canada because being Canadian, they thought I might feel more comfortable having it done in, in Canada. And uh, uh, what ended up is that I, I ended up um, choosing uh, Dr. Doretti Fufa uh, from the Hospital for Special Surgeries because when I read her um, uh, information, uh, it was like she was custom made for, for me. Her expertise was in the hand and microvascular surgery. I mean, it was just amazing. It was all the, the for, for, for uh, uh, my very specific injuries and, and the extent of it. So. Yeah. So then I, I, they met back me, and, and my sister was with me through the hole. She came with me to, to uh, New York, and she was in Germany, and, and uh, um, so yeah. So I, it's it's. Uh, then I ended up at the hospital for special surgeries, and I've had uh, fourteen um, between Germany and there, because Germany I had to go into the operating room several times just to make sure that everything was clean, and because at the time it was so new, and so there was a lot of work, and I had. Uh, a huge thing on the outside trying to keep the hand connected mm -hmm. to the arm and everything and they had to do all kinds of work. And you wore out several physical therapists, I understand. Well, we, I, they, <laughs> I was busy trying to, trying to get back as much as I could, so, so we, we, I have, I have uh, worked a few of them. <laughs> so, and I'm still sort of, on, I have a few more surgeries to go, three more, but we're hopeful that um, I'll be able to get uh, Good movement from my my left uh, hand. We're not sure how much, but we're we're fingers crossed. We'll get. Uh, and so. you are naturally right-handed. I'm naturally right-handed, which is wonderful. And my <laughs> handwriting is very difficult to to read, but it was very it's difficult true. before. Yes, exactly. So, so. so I mean, it's not it hasn't changed that much. That's so yeah, so very fortunate in so many ways. The um, I can tell you that the <laughs> AP spent a great many hours worrying about you during the time that you were wounded and worrying about Anya and, and what would happen. Um, unfortunately, we've had experience with this before. Mm -hmm. 
uh, last year was particularly a difficult year for the AP. Um, but we have had people wounded in the field and come out very well, and usually because of their strength, mm -hmm. which you've certainly shown. Uh, I know you have said that you want to go back. Yes, absolutely. To Afghanistan to report, not absolutely. just to visit. Yeah, absolutely. Can I mean, you can you tell me what story you want to do first? Well, I have to tell you, I know exactly the story I want to do, really. I mean, I have two stories that I want to do. Um, one of them actually is in Pakistan, and mm -hmm. it comes out of the uh, CIA uh, torture report, um, because we had broken the story about the one Afghan who had died in the, um, uh, um, it was called the salt mine. Yeah. It's in Afghanistan. Right. Anyway, and they, the report was spoke very much about it, and I know the family because I had gotten to know. So there, I really would like to tell that story on him very much. On he had three daughters in that culture. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult, and they really, until this report came out, there was no uh, um, even knowledge that he mm -hmm. that he was dead. So they couldn't bury him. They couldn't, you mm -hmm. know, um, even acknowledge that he was he was gone. So I, I would like to do that story from very much a sort of a cultural sort of understanding of what, what that really meant because mm -hmm. it happened in 2002 and only in 2015, 14 at the end of last mm -hmm. year and this year did all this come out. So I, I really want to try and explain how that affected one mm -hmm. family and sort of uh, in that way. So that, that story I would, I would like to do. And the, one, and the sto one story I really would like to do in Afghanistan, I mean, there are so many ones uh, that I would like to do, but I'd really like to sort of look at, at um, uh, to understand where the, the, the security forces are going in terms of, because they really sort of have gotten a raw deal, as have Afghans in terms of, um, being saddled with a lot of people who were very difficult in the first place, and, and Afghans knew, but they were chosen because it was expedient to do so, and, and the West didn't know anybody else, or, or they, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, mm -hmm. and, and, and that was. So it, it's really created in Afghanistan that um, is, is, is I'd like to show how what kind of an Afghanistan is created in mm -hmm. terms of both for the people and for the, the, the security forces who are really undertrained and under equipped and, and uh, to be able to do this job and uh, and in many ways they're sort of getting a, a, a bum rap as being un incapable or inept or and, and I just think that there's such a, a, an important story to be told to explain where Afghanistan is and how it got there and which is a much bigger sort of look but I, I would really like to do some, something like that that would sort of look at that. I, I know through your career, Kathy, you have always wanted to go and bear witness, which is what Anya and you did so well. Uh, you embedded with the Afghan forces, you embedded with the Pakistani forces, the mm -hmm. pair of you. Uh, you were the first Western correspondents to embed with the Afghans, if mm -hmm. I'm not yeah, wrong. Absolutely. Uh, you also took an oil tanker from Pakistan into Afghanistan. You want to tell us about that trip? Yeah, that was uh, that was our first trip actually together, Anya and I. And um, and actually, when I met Anya, uh, I mean, I knew of, of Anya and she knew of me, and we had exchanged emails on the courage in journalism because she had uh, received the International Women's Media Foundation Courage in Journalism, and I had, and so we had exchanged emails. But we really didn't meet until much later, and uh, and so that evening, the, the of the day that we met, because when we first met, it was in the kitchen of the AP house, and uh, Anya had just come back from an embed with the Canadian soldiers down in Kandahar. Well, I've done an embed yes with the Afghan, and then but I haven't done any with the the coalition forces, mm -hmm. um, except for like a two day thing with the Germans, because Anya wanted to do something. So I said to her, "Oh yeah, I don't do military." <laughs> <laughs> and she, and she was just so mad. She says, "Well, that's not all I do, you know." <laughs> so, so the first little was a, a little heated, and then that evening, there's this balcony at the AP house at the upstairs, and we were sitting there having a glass of wine. And well, by the end of the evening, it was as if we'd known each other our entire lives. We were laughing and joking, and I had said, "I really want to do this story that where you take an oil tank, uh, the one of the oil tankers that." Uh, brings fuel to the troops in Kandahar. Well, it has to go through Pakistan. Right. It has to go through Pakistan from Karachi on the Arabian Sea, mm -hmm. through Quetta, which is in Balochistan, mm -hmm. which is, uh, is a quite a, a dangerous province, and uh, to the border with uh, Afghanistan, and then across into Kandahar. Mm -hmm. Or 
you go up to uh, Peshawar, which is in the north, uh, northwest, uh, further north. So I really wanted, what I really, really wanted to do was I wanted to go from Quetta, in, which is the capital of Baluchistan, and it's a two-day trip, roughly, because you have to go through a pass, it's very slow, to go into Kandahar with a, a, um, a fuel tanker and to tell the story of the driver, who are very poor, they're, they're tribes people, um, they make the equivalent of $100 for each trip, hugely dangerous for them because they're always being attacked. The Taliban are always planting bombs underneath them, just these magnetic bombs that they slap onto the bottom of them, they explode. Very, very dangerous for them. I mean, we took a risk, but it was, you know, I mean, these, they, this is their lives. And we wanted to tell that story. I mean, I had wanted to, so I was telling Anya, you know, and I really, and I, I had pitched it a couple of years before to, uh, to AP and to, to uh, the desk, and they, were, they liked the idea, but then they said, no, it's a bit dangerous, and, and I couldn't get photos and TV to really sign on, and there wasn't anybody who was really gung-ho to do it. Well, Anya, she just really wanted to do it. And uh, so, we managed to get uh, permissions, and Anya could do the video. So mm -hmm. she had the the she was doing the photography, and I was doing the printing, the print rather, the writing, and she was doing the videoing. And uh, and we spent two two days, and it, it was really it was such a beautiful story of this uh, uh, truck driver, and and really we got to see so much. And it's very funny because. Um, for all the dangers that could have been on that trip, our biggest problems were with U.S. soldiers, um, which they detained us for an hour. We were just so upset. We were really upset on the, uh, as soon as you crossed over into Afghanistan, into mm -hmm. Spinbuldak, because I'm a big believer of you have your visas, you do everything proper. So we crossed over into Afghanistan. We Anya took her pictures. We went right to the customs people, mm -hmm. the, the passport people, handed our passports. I, Anya had her visa, mm -hmm. I had mine. Poor guy, it was his first day at the office <laughs> at the, the passport control. And, and there's these two women, <laughs> foreign women. Right, a Canadian <laughs> and a German. And a German, yeah, <gasps> with their passports, the proper visa, everything. So he looked and everything was in order. He stamped it and we went on our way and, and we went back to our, our, our truck driver. And they stay initially in this area, and he had told us, and the Americans are there. It was an African, but the Americans are also there. So he was very, uh, very funny. So, so I only wanted to take more pictures of him coming across, you mm -hmm. know, and so she was outside. And I saw an American soldier, so I'm thinking, oh, great day, you know. So I go up and I, hi, you know, how are you doing? And, and he kind of looks and he kind of growls. And, and then he goes over to Anya and he st stops her from taking pictures. And so I went over to him. I didn't have a chance to say who I was. And I said, what, what are you doing? This isn't your country. And uh, right off the bat, um, <laughs> which clearly didn't interfere. Diplomatic. Me. Of, diplomatic. Always, always, always a diplomat. Always. And, and Anya, of course, was upset as well, and she said, I can take pictures, and, and he said, you know, even the Afghans are upset, well, which wasn't true, because I said to him, I said, we have our visa, everything is in order, and the Afghan um, head of the security there, he invited us over for a cup of tea, so he wasn't the least bit bothered. And, um, but I was really upset, and, and uh, they wanted to detain us, take us to an American base, and, uh, and I said to them, because we were going to Kandahar with mm -hmm. the tanker, uh, well, to the base at the Kandahar Airport, the, the big base at the Kandahar mm -hmm. Airport, because it's, it's 500 million liters of fuel every day mm -hmm. that the, the military requires to run that war. Mm -hmm. It was such an interesting story and so important. And here you have these guys that really are the linchpin, mm -hmm. you know, making $100 a, a, a month, you know, or a run. Um, so, really good. but then Anya and I were going to go into Kandahar, the city, and, and stay for a week and do other stories, mm -hmm. you know. So I said to him, I said, you know, he said, well, you know, it's very dangerous. And I said, fine, our business, you know, we're, we're you know. And he says, no, you have to come across to the base. And I said, you know, it's going to, because for your own safety. And I said, you're causing us more problems because if anybody sees us with you, immediately they're mm -hmm. going to they're gonna believe one thing. But anyway, they were very insistent. Um, I was equally insistent. He said, uh, he called this commanding officer who said, uh, we would like you to. And so I said to him, would you like me to or, or are you insisting that I do? He says, we're insisting that you do. <laughs> so I said, you know, I argued again and again. And, and finally, uh, they just got fed up and they said, fine. And at one point they said, well, you know why there are so few trucks here? just to show us them, because there had been a couple of bombings the mm. day before, or whatever, uh, suicide bombings the day before or something. 
or some IEDs. And he says, you know, all the truck drivers have been told that there's going to be a couple, no, that there's going to be a couple of suicide bombers. And this is why we're really concerned. I looked at him and I said, I said, first, the Taliban don't notify the truckers. And second, there's a huge snowstorm on the other side of the border and the pass is closed. So none of the trucks are here because they're all, they're all stopped by the snow on the pass. We, we were stuck. So, so he says, well, yes, but it's still very dangerous. Anyway, in the end, they, they let us go. But then they called the office and they said, uh, they said there's two people because we didn't give our names. I, mm. I wouldn't give our names. I just said we were with the Associated Press. And, and so they called the office and they said, uh, they said there's two uh, women here parading as, uh, as uh, AP journalists. <laughs> so the <laughs> office, <laughs> I said parading. <laughs> so, so the office had to say, no, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> parading. Yeah, yeah. yeah just, just never mind. <laughs> they are AP. Yeah. So yeah. then we went into Kandahar and, and we, we did that story on the truckers, which was wonderful. It was fabulous. But Anya was so funny because it was the first time she'd done the video. Eh? So every time she'd raise the camera, she'd tell everybody to keep quiet. So as soon as the camera and the translator, everybody, the truck, the drivers, she'd go, shh, you know, so I, you know. So as soon as the camera would go up, I'd say to everybody, so she she do that. She got she got there. She sends it. She edits it. She sends it in. Everything. First thing they say is, "How come there's no sound?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's too quiet. Yeah. Um, Anya said, "Well, because she's a photographer. Yeah. She was looking at at how she placed it. The pictures. She was looking at the pictures and everything. And she just thought the sound would just interfere with everything because. So I would have to do my interviews off camera eh, because she was wanted yeah. us to be quiet on camera." <laughs> And they wanted the trucker to be talking. They yeah. wanted to have all this stuff. But a little no. ambient noise would have been okay. <laughs> no, she just wanted, there was some, he of course had, had uh, horrible music playing in the car and, mm -hmm. and there was the traffic noises and stuff like that. But that's all Anya wanted. She didn't want, she didn't want to hear anybody's voice. So then when, when she submitted it, they said, uh, they said, you know, the pictures are great, but how come there's no sound? <laughs> I mean, don't have any interviews. <laughs> So anyway, so that was our first trip together, and 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 it just it it was it was fun, and Anya loved uh, doing these stories, and um, it was because neither one of us um, actually traveled with anybody. She didn't really like writers <laughs> so much, I know, surprising, eh? Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> and. Uh, and I often traveled by myself as well, you know, and so so we were very, very much that way. And so it was very funny that we found each other and, and, and it was really such a, a strong, strong connection. And, 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 and we both uh, uh, shared that desire for the kinds of stories we wanted to tell, how we wanted to tell them. Um, who we wanted to 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 tell those stories, not the politician, not the the, mm -hmm. the government, not the the uh, uh, people in in power, but you know the people. So it was really an amazing find. Our our our, our friendship and our our um, uh, uh, stories that we we did. I mean, not one of them was without a huge amount of fun huge amount of fun while we were doing them. And, and most of the ones that we did were far more dangerous than the one that actually, where the attack was. Because mm -hmm. that was actually probably one of the safer um, places we'd been, one of the, uh, that particular one. The next day, maybe during the election might have been tricky, you know, when they, we were covering those who were going to vote. That might have been when you're out and about. But that particular going out at that day uh, when the shooting occurred was actually probably one of the safer or, or least dangerous of the places. Right, and the lesson there is there's no protection from an insider attack. Exactly. This was a police officer. This was a police commander. So a police commander. There is no getting around it. Well, and there had been a lot of attacks against U.S. soldiers mm -hmm. uh, by uh, Afghan soldiers. Yes. Certainly they had, that had increased tremendously. Um, in that last little while before the shooting um, of Anya and myself, um, it had actually been uh, relative quiet in terms of insider attacks or attacks by mm -hmm. Afghan soldiers on U.S. soldiers. Um, and Kabul had actually been quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. The Norwegian journalists had been killed. There had been an attack at the Serena Hotel and an Afghan journalist, such a nice, nice man, uh, and his two children and his wife were killed and, and, uh, and other uh, Canadian, I believe, or three or four other people. 
and the night before we left for host, I had talked to this uh, fellow from the U.S. Institute of Peace, who was an old, old friend and an old, old Afghan and Pakistan hand. Um, and he had jokingly said, you know, host is probably the safer place to be during this election than Kabul, because Kabul had been really hit. Kabul had been very dangerous had in been hit, recent yeah, weeks. Absolutely. It had been hit with, with uh, several, several suicide bombings. Uh, blatant attacks. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the Norwegian, I think it was the Norwegian journalist, it was yes. only two blocks from the house, and two people just came up to him, point blank in the head, gone. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you, you can't, you know, I mean, you, you try to understand your risks, um, take the best precautions that you can, and then you do your job. And you don't not do it because there is a risk, otherwise you shouldn't be in a conflict zone. There, it is a conflict zone, so you have to accept that. And, but you do try your best to, to mitigate the risks and make sure that you, you've, you've taken all the precautions so that no matter what, nobody can say, why did you do that? You, 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 mm -hmm. you know, and I always used to say that to Anya because this friend of mine used to say to me, it's bad enough if something happens to you, but if people then turn around and say, oh, that Kathy, she was so stupid. Why did she do that? She didn't no matter. You know, then it's, you know, it's like, it's. So I was always, always, and as was Anya, we were always very, very aware of, of our environment, of the risks, of the situation, and we did everything possible to make it as safe as you possibly could. Well, Given still going out. Yes. I mean, because it's, it's a, it, it it is part of your reporting life, mm -hmm. Kathy Gannon, to go out, as, as it was part of Anya's. Um, another place that you went out was the parts of Pakistan mm -hmm. where Absolutely. people cannot go. Mm, absolutely. I spent a lot of time in the, the tribal areas in, in northwest Pakistan, um, up in Swat, and in these areas up on the border with uh, uh, Afghanistan in, in north, uh, uh, north western uh, Pakistan. Uh, on the border with Kunar in Afghanistan, which is in northeastern, which is a was deadly, deadly area because the U.S. forces were even forced to, to pull out of that area. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, there, there are certainly even some of the cities that where there's there's been a lot of killings. Um, I was able to get to Quetta when, when uh, very few others were able to. There was only one other foreign correspondent that was ever able to get, that was able to get there in the last uh, couple of years, mm -hmm. um, and and even he didn't go as often. But because there was so many vicious killings of the Shias in in Quetta and, and that area, so um, so yeah, and 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 it was just so important for me to go out and tell their story and to to. Because people, when they read it or they, 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 they see the pictures and that, you can relate to it. You can understand another person and, and something happening to them. And you can understand the, the fear that somebody has when, when, when you can't uh, uh, take the proper, uh, there's nothing you can do against a suicide bomber. You know that you're targeted just by your very, you know, uh, who you are. And so the only ones who could tell those stories are the, are the people who, and not just, I mean, in Pakistan and, and in Afghanistan, which are really the, the areas of my, my uh, uh, coverage and where I've spent the longest time. And, but uh, also, uh, you know, I spent a fair bit of time in Central Asia, was, was in uh, Uzbekistan and, and uh, the Andajan Valley, which is, you know, where the old Silk Route and, um, one of the stories I did there, and again, it was in the in the Andajan Valley, was about uh, how they were arresting a lot of these business people who they accused of being um, fundamentalists and Islamic radicals, which they weren't. They were orthodox, but they weren't radicals or anything. But I wrote a big story saying that, um, it, you know, it's just it's ready to explode, not because of uh, a religious reason, but because you were arresting the very the business people, mm -hmm. and they were employing people. And it was already a, a, a desperately poor area. And then you took away their, their source of income. So people were really angry. And they were angry because they, they had lost their source of income and were continuing to. So we did a big story. I did a big story on that. And, and, uh, and sure enough, two weeks later, there was a huge riot and something like 1,000 people were killed. Um, varying uh, accounts of how many, but but uh, the non-government account is about a thousand. And the Uzbek government then later uh, brought a court case uh, 
uh, and they named me among the the, mm -hmm. uh, the plaintiffs, saying that I had actually helped to to instigate it because the story had you been so <laughs> had been so timely that they had said that I had helped to instigate it. So, needless to say, I didn't get another visa. No, <laughs> uh, yeah. probably not going back there soon. But, but speaking of visas, tell uh, tell me how you got started. Tell me, yeah. go back to Canada and get us to Afghanistan. How did that happen? Yeah, that was a tricky one. Um, actually, uh, I, I started at newspapers in Canada, of course. I mean, I worked across uh, Canada from um, uh, northern Canada, which is where I'm from. Uh, my first job was at a, a paper in Timmins, Ontario, which I have to say, in, in terms of the newspaper field, mm -hmm. Um, uh, the other person to have gotten his start in Timmins was uh, Lord Thompson of Fleet, okay. who, of course, owns owned the, the Times of London. I'm sure that uh, Thompson still owns the Times of London, but uh, they certainly own a lot. And uh, his first uh, possession, actually, was the Timmins uh, radio station and newspaper. So he and I, we have a lot in common. <laughs> No, <laughs> that's where it ends. So I, I, I started off in Timmins, and then I worked across uh, Canada. And I mean, I guess I always wanted to go overseas to to uh, to work and to, to do stories. But in Canada, we don't have a lot of national newspapers mm -hmm. where you could get on and mm -hmm. get posted to it. And I, and I realized that, you know. I mean, um, you would have to really spend 20 years at one newspaper mm -hmm. and we really probably only have about three mm -hmm. that would have bureaus around the world that would And then they'd send you to London. And then they'd send me someplace to London or something. Yeah, that would be my luck. So but I thought before I leave Canada I really would like to, to spend time in Canada, in parts of Canada I, I hadn't been to. So I actually worked my way across western Canada. Um, I was a city editor in Kelowna in the Okanagan Valley that's just uh, um, near the Vancouver, uh, Alberta, uh, Saskatchewan, um, very small province which I love, absolutely love. Um, very interesting and it's one of those that I, you, you, only if you liked really weird and, and interesting things which you, which you really claw on to Saskatchewan. I love it. Um, but anyway, so, so I worked my way across uh, Western Canada before I, I then, um, a friend of mine who was a photographer, he um, had been to Peshawar, oh, a couple of years before and had taken some beautiful pictures of the refugees. This was maybe in the early 80s mm -hmm. uh, that he had gone. And so he really wanted to go back. Were the refugees Afghans then? Afghans, yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. because that was when the Russians were right. in, yeah, absolutely. This when the Russians were in Afghanistan, so there were like five million of them living mm -hmm. in Pakistan on the border because the Russians were in Afghanistan from 1979 to 1989. So he had been there in the early 80s. Beautiful images. He was a lovely, lovely photographer and, and also a great heart. But so, so then I thought, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And I always wanted to go to Israel and, and, and uh, um, do the stories on, on uh, Israel and, and uh, South Lebanon and, and kibbutz. And, I mean, I just all, you know, that was for me, I thought that's what I want to do. So we went to Israel first <laughs> and we spent uh, a year and a half in, uh, in Haifa. And we were doing freelance, and we did a lot of interesting things, you know, I mean, uh, really interesting things, like, you know, like 24 hours on one of these uh, patrol boats, and um, the Israeli patrol boats in the south, and this is when the occupation mm -hmm. of South Lebanon was, was, uh, was, was in full swing, and um, spent a lot of time up at the border, you know, where the Katushka, Katushas were coming in and, and, and hitting some of the, the northern areas um, of, of Israel. And they don't do very much damage. They're sort of, you know, I mean, in hindsight now, I think they really do do very little <laughs> compared to some of the stuff I've seen now. Uh, but uh, but then it's just coming from from Canada. From Canada, so, that was a lot. Oh yeah. my goodness, it was just you know, and I loved it. I, I just loved it. Um, and so then we went to Peshawar, and um, we stayed there. Because it's a logical spot. Because mm -hmm. it's a logical spot. <laughs> we had to go by way of Egypt, of course, because <laughs> you can't go. There are no direct flights yes. from from Tel Aviv to to Islamabad. Nope. Um, so so we we went to Cairo. Mm -hmm. uh, we took the bus down to Cairo. Of course, we were freelancing and, and weren't making a whole bunch of money, uh, not much at all. And so we took the bus down, and uh, and then we flew from Cairo to um, Islamabad. 
Middle East and then on to, to uh, can't remember where, maybe Dubai and then on to Islamabad. And, um, and then went up to Peshawar. And uh, we were there for maybe about three or four months and then and had gone inside with the Mujahideen who were supported by the U.S. and not mm -hmm. against the Russians. And the Russians were still there. And, um, and then we ran out of money. Um, so we, uh, some f very good friends of ours were in Tokyo. So we went to Tokyo to, to work teaching English. And, and then I did some editing for the Yomiri Shimbun, the English language. And, and then we both saved up some money. Joe did some odd jobs um, and, uh, and went back. And then really that was, we got back there in 80, late 86, just uh, or early 86. It was just before the Mujahideen were given the Stinger missiles. Mm -hmm. um, so we had gone in at one point where the, the Russians, because they, before the Stinger, so they could come in really low, like mm -hmm. with the gunships and that, and, and, and a few times there was very, very close calls and going through minefields, and it was just really was. Um, so yeah, and then it was in Peshawar. We were living in Peshawar, um, uh, renting a part of a house and for very, very little. And uh, that's when I actually started with AP, as a, um, first as a stringer in Peshawar, and then in, 88, uh, middle of 88, m middle I think, um, I was uh, asked by uh, Brian Wilder, was the bureau chief at the time mm -hmm. in Islamabad, and the number two there had left to go to um, South Africa, I believe. And I mean, she since then did come back to AP and then left to get back. She's, uh, so he asked, would I be interested in coming? Well, I thought, <laughs> He's so nice to have a regular pay, <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so I thought, sure, let me, you know, give it a try. I, I, I sure wouldn't mind. So that's how I ended up uh, in, uh, and so I was uh, hired as a local hire mm -hmm. initially in, in Pakistan. Um, so, uh, and I came to Islamabad. And, and before long, you made your way to Kabul, because that's where the real war was. And before long, I made my way to Kabul. I'd been in and out of Afghanistan, yes. for sure, before that. And then on uh, February uh, 15th is when the Russians pulled out of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So we had somebody doing the uh, um, Afghan, the withdrawal, of course. And then I did the other uh, side. I went with the Mujahideen, and it was like a week and a half just to get there because you had to go the back mm -hmm. way and you had to go um, partially on buses then it broke down and because it was winter of course February was cold and they're walking around like with you know sandals and uh, it was just so cold and we'd be on a bus and it'd break down and then they'd stop somebody else and we'd get on something and anyway by took us about a week or a week and a half to get to the other side of Kabul but outside where the Mujahideen mm -hmm. were so that I gave that side of the story, and then we had the other where the Russians were actually pulling mm -hmm. out and leaving Kabul, and, and that. so it was, yeah, it was, uh, uh, that was sort of my last, my big first AP story f out of uh, Afghanistan. And then you covered the Taliban. I covered. They rapidly became a power. I did. I did. I, I uh, first I was there uh, often between 92 and 96 mm -hmm. when the Mujahideen w took power uh, from the communists and uh, and those are the people that the uh, US and the coalition aligned themselves with mm -hmm. after 2001 and that time was 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 hugely dangerous mm -hmm. because there was so much going on in Kabul mm -hmm. in terms of bombings and, and and incoming and outcoming and I remember being in the basement of the AP house and counting like 200 incoming and outgoing within two, three minutes. I can't remember exactly. And you could always say to like to Amr Shah, who's the AP uh, correspondent in, in uh, Kabul, um, and Mohammed Ghul, who looks after the house. I mean, wonderful, wonderful people. I mean, we, we couldn't manage without them. And uh, saying, incoming, outgoing, incoming? <laughs> and they'd say, no, outgoing. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so it was really was, because like 50,000 people mm -hmm. were, were killed during that time. And then um, I was, uh, a lot of it has been really good luck and timing. I, uh, it was September uh, 1996, and I was going into Kabul. Um, the Taliban were at, outside of the, the, the capital at Policharki. And I was going in thinking I'd go in for, I don't know, 
a couple of days, see, see how things are going. But I thought, oh, if the Taliban are going to come in, it's going to be six months at least before the Taliban could come into Kabul because others had tried it. Take it. So and, uh, we landed at Kabul airport, Red Cross flight. Everybody's getting on the flight. And I'm saying, you know, why? And they said, yeah, yeah, no, we have to. The Taliban are going to be here. And, those fools. And so uh, so that day, we, we went and we went to the front line. It was a lot of rocketing. It was quite dangerous. And I interviewed uh, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, as a matter of fact, who said, we will be here until the last drop of blood and, and we're not leaving. And that evening, <laughs> before the last drop of blood, they all disappeared. Mm -hmm. And there had been a lot of, of, of uh, fighting and back and forth. And we had been at the UN guest house. And Amr Shah or somebody said, you want to go by uh, the defense ministry, they're all gone. And I said, laughed. And I said, no, they're not all gone. It turned out everybody had left. And by four in the morning, we woke up and the Taliban had a tank outside our doors with the morning prayers and everything. So I wasn't even close with how long it would take them to get there. And then, then that morning, uh, Najib's body and his uh, brothers were hanging from the uh, town square. And as it turned out, we were on the last flight into Kabul for the next 10 days because then there was nobody coming in. Or, or Excellent flying. timing. Excellent timing. <laughs> but certainly not planned because I thought we were only there for a couple of days. <laughs> so, so, but actually it's been, and, and really it's true, so much of the good fortune you, you, you have in terms of, of your timing and your, you know, it's like when Ben Azir was overthrown in September and I got a call from New York from the desk saying, you know, there's a lot of talk, you know, she could be, it, it's, you know, uh, could happen anytime. I said, absolutely, and it's very serious, and I said, but it's not going to happen overnight. <laughs> Two o'clock in the morning, she's gone. <laughs> what? I mean, fortunately, I was up and I had gotten a call, and so we were we had gotten it. And we were the first ones with it and everything. And no, but and I thought, oh God, the desk is going to think. The last time we ask her what's going, on, what's going to happen? No, it's not going to happen well, overnight. Fortunately, we don't get paid to predict. <laughs> yeah. so you Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness. But fortunately, and and uh, there was somebody I knew at the presidency, and they called and they said the lights are all on and and things are not looking good. And then we, we got the story quite quickly that Ben Azir was gone. All right, let, let's talk about one more major figure. I know you didn't interview him, but we certainly talked about him a lot. And I know you wrote about him a lot, and that's Osama bin Laden. Oh, Osama. When, mm -hmm. when I think back to 98, when, the, the, uh, when Al Qaeda attacked the embassies in East Africa, and then I think and it was only three years later, almost really two years and nine months, that 9-11 happened. And I think, and Kathy and I talked about Osama bin Laden a lot during that time. Absolutely. And she wrote about him a lot. Mm -hmm. I did. I did. It now feels to me like it was a really long time between 98 and 2001. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because we did, and, and I remember a Holbrook was there, and, and I think mm -hmm. it was 98, and I had, the only story I said is the story on uh, bin Laden. There is no other story um, from his visit, and, and that, and I had done peace, and we had run it, and then there was another piece, and, I, and Holbrook said, yeah, yeah, we've talked to them, and everything is good. And I remember even in, in August of 2001, um, I think I, it was August 2001, uh, I was I was here and I, I was, remember I was giving a talk or something and somebody said you know I was talking about the Taliban and, and uh, Afghanistan and Osama bin Laden and on and on and one person um, just asked just so but what what does it have to do with us like why should we care was was the question mm -hmm. and and I thought okay fair enough but I said because you've got an international. Uh, 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 um, potential threat, and, and clearly there's been no suggestion that they're not interested, not the mm -hmm. Taliban, but certainly Al-Qaeda, in terms of using that as a, mm -hmm. as, as a base. I said, you know, maybe the Taliban, sure, Mullah Omar can barely find New York, but Al-Qaeda, that's, that's a very different thing. So yeah, it's very interesting because we, we definitely did, and, and that's why, and, and since the shooting, I mean, everybody sort of said, oh, Kathy, you know, you've spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. And then I sort of look back at the body of work and, and the types of stories. Um, and and I, I think, and, and I, I really am very proud of, of, of them and the, the information because we, we did it. And a lot of that comes from you in the desk and saying, you know, what about this and what about that? But, but when I look back and I say, no, but it's true. It, it, it does come from that, too. And as you said, we did talk a lot about Osama. So, so it does come from that. But then you look at the work and, 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 and actually, we were really a, 
ahead of the curve on so many things. You were. Uh, well, well, yeah, okay, but we were, AP was, and, and certainly um, uh, I couldn't have been if, if the desk wasn't behind me, because then where would the stories go? You know, I mean, let's be honest here. I mean, I have no illusion. Um, I was, when I went into Kabul, when I was the only uh, Western reporter, when the Taliban let me back in, that's why when I got shot, when I went back to Pakistan just for a brief, uh, over Christmas, people said, you know, I, 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 we were so surprised that the Taliban shot you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I, I don't know if it was the top. <laughs> but, but, uh, but anyway, they had let me in. And, and, and the only reason that they had, frankly and honestly, was because Amir Shah, our, our colleague and, and the AP uh, correspondent, who's, who's such a wonderful oh God, person and knows everybody, and he just harassed them to death. And I harassed Amir Shah. And so finally they said, you know, and they all knew me because I'd been on the front lines and I'd been there for so much during those, you know, the Buddhas, you know. Well, I'd, and didn't you have a Taliban neighbor? I had, yeah, yeah, we had a couple of them. We had the Minister of Vice and Virtue, who was just really a pain. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but we also had the, the Minister of Health. Well, it sounds a little bit like Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, and then we, we had the Minister of, of, of uh, Public Health, who was actually very very nice, you know, he had gone to Tokyo, and I remember I, w I used to, they, of course they don't shake a woman's hand, eh? but I used to just put my hand out just for the fun of it sometimes, <laughs> you know, you're bored, and this, <laughs> he, he had, uh, he had one time this, this Taliban, and he had just come back from Tokyo, and he must have been just, I mean, these guys, some of them, eh? they'd barely been out of Kandahar. Anyway, so I put my <laughs> hand out, and he, he, he didn't know what to do, before they would have just scowled, he didn't know what to do, so he takes the two fingers and he goes, <laughs> so sweet. <laughs> And I used to always, when I'd be doing interviews and that, poor Amr Shah, I'd be saying things like, so, because you always ask, and so how many children do you have? And some he'd say, well, I have um, five boys. And, and, and I'd say, well, any girls? And he'd say, yes, one. I'd say, I'm so sorry, just one, really? Only one girl, that's so sad. And then somebody else would say, somebody else would say, I have, you know, five, uh, I, I'd say, how many children? They'd say, one or something. And, and I'd say, only one. They'd say, well, one boy and five girls. I said, Five girls, you are so lucky. You're kidding me. And they'd look at me like, you know, <laughs> is she insane? And then there'd be, if there were kids around, this is where you'd be out because you could travel during their time, I have to say. You could travel anywhere. So I'd be out doing a story on the poppies or mm -hmm. doing some story and it'd be out in the middle of nowhere. And of course, the kids always come around. And so there'd be little girls there. And I'd say to them, So what do you want to do when you grow up? And, well, I don't know. You know, I'd say, Would you like to be prime minister of Afghanistan? <laughs> and the Taliban would just sort of look like, <laughs> this poor crazy foreigner. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, used, I used to argue with him, and one Taliban he said to me once, he said, You know, we call people like you, eh? And I said, What? He said, A man. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we laughed. He laughed, I didn't laugh. <laughs> no. But anyway, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I, I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to get back into Kabul during the bombing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, after after the, the, the bombing had begun on, on October 7, 2001. And I went in on October 21st, I think, 2001, and the Taliban fled on November the 13th, 2001. And again, I mean, so grateful that I was able to. Um, uh, it never occurred to me to be afraid to go. Or, or I mean, I was just so, I, I remember crossing the border and just saying, oh, man, and we were driving on to Jalalabad. I was just thinking, I can't believe I'm finally here. I mean, I was just in tears. I wanted to be there so badly for this. And, uh, and people were sneaking in, getting caught. And I just thought, what's the point? You sneak in in a burqa. First, what can you do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing. And second, the story is about you. That's mm -hmm. all. Because mm -hmm. then you get caught and it's, oh, look at this, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so-and-so went in and she was caught and she, the, the Taliban said, well, anyway, the story is you. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the story. So I, that was why I was just so, and, and I had a visa, and, and, mm. and so we finally got permission from Kandahar to let me in. And, uh, but again, Ellen, had, had, had the desk not been supportive, and um, those stories wouldn't have, have been of interest, in a, you know, in that desire. I mean, yes, I'd still have that desire because I'm a reporter, and, mm -hmm. and we all, this is what we do. but. But because the desk also, you know, and you're also saying, okay, Kathy, what are you doing? And, you know, what about this? And, you know, there's that same connection from you to me that, that ensures that those stories 
get the play that 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 uh, that they can, and and that that the 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 desk wants them. Because if they don't, then you know, if there's no encouragement to do them, then you 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 don't uh, you don't make that extra effort. I mean, you know, I mean, you, you'll make some, of course, because that's what you want to do. But you don't. There has to be that connection. There just has to be for it to work, in my mind, anyway. And certainly, that's the way it's been for me. Tell us about. What is this, what is the Overseas Press Club meant for you? Um, you know, a few things uh, the Overseas Press Club of America has meant for me. First, there was sort of that sense of, of um, community and, and belonging because, you know, you read through the list and there, there's journalists you know, there's journalists you've heard of, there's journalists whose uh, uh, books are being promoted, there's journalists who are speaking. So it was really sort of... Uh, and, and I'm living in, in Pakistan and Afghanistan, and I'm traveling in all these different places and, and doing these different stories. And you sometimes don't feel that close connection because you're, you're very far away. So there was that, um, I, uh, the newsletters that would come all the time and, and wonderful because the OPC always sent them to Pakistan. So I always got them and, and, and so I could read who was doing what, what had happened. So there, there's that, that sense of community was really important. Um, when I published my book, my first book, um, and um, was very excited about it, it's uh, called Eyes for Infidel. And it, um, it sort of gave a very, very nice look, I think, of uh, uh, who these people were that the um, U.S. coalition, not just the U.S., but the entire coalition, mm -hmm. had partnered with post-2001. And I think it also gave a much more realistic view of the Taliban because um, I was one of the very few journalists who spent a great deal of time there during the mm -hmm. Taliban. So I wasn't sort of overwhelmed by stereotypes and, and, mm -hmm. and, and all these, these uh, the talk that maybe didn't really reflect the reality 100%. So uh, the, it was um, the OPC one evening had a wonderful um, book launch night mm -hmm. for me. Which was really for me. I mean, I'd had different book launches, which was which was wonderful. But for me, at the OPC, it was very nice because um, I felt like it was my peers who were saying, uh, not just congratulations, but gee, we're interested in what you've done and 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 uh, um, what does it mean to you and that. So so there's there's that that the uh, overseas press club has meant um, and and just sort of reaching out, you know, like uh, Sonia, who was the the there then and the head of it she would, would just send me a nice email saying you know thinking about you um, hope everything is good so and so is going to be there in that area you know can I introduce you to them so there was sort of that constant mm -hmm. connection you know so you you felt connected so I think that would have to be sort of one of the big things that, that it has meant to me